Um, so welcome, everyone. Thank you for being here. Uh, my name is Kim Porter. I am joined by uh, my colleague, Bob Lamb, who is the Director of Operations and Programs. Uh, this is part of our Youth Marijuana Prevention Project, which is funded by our partners at Montgomery County Drug Alcohol. So thank you very much, Montgomery County, for supporting this. This is the fifth of a five-year grant. And so uh, we've we would love to tell you that we have eradicated all questions or all problems or uh, associated with cannabis use in the state of Pennsylvania, but we're still working on it. We have a long way to go, um, but we're really glad that you're here to learn all that we can share about um, cannabis use today. And uh, we have a really great guest with who I will introduce you to in just a moment. He's going to give you some great his great expertise. Uh, we are recording this program. Um, if you ask any questions that are rather personal in nature, we will not, we'll make sure that those are edited out of the recording before it's posted on YouTube. Um, we have a um, survey that will come up at the end of this program. So we please ask you to please take a moment to complete that survey and let us know your thoughts about this program. Also to share um, any requests for future topics that you would love to hear. We really, really appreciate you taking a moment to do that because we need to hear from you as far as um, programming that we need to address in the future. Um, but we, we will have time for Q&A at the end of Dr. Calkins' presentation. Our follow-up page is conversation.zone slash cannabis and Bob Lamb will be sharing some of these links in the chat. Uh, that's one of them that where you can find lots of information on that page, um, some other past recordings that are relevant. Um, some other programs that we have coming up that I thought some of you might be interested in. Um, this is part of Montgomery County funding as well, the 21st Century Teens. This is a great opportunity um, to hear, to speak with folks who are working with young people. Um, we're going to talk about process addictions, basically. So we, we will get into a little bit of substance use, but really looking at gaming, gambling, social media, shopping, exercise, relationships, all sorts of other things that can be behaviors that that are a distraction for young people that could become problematic if not kept in check. So uh, really terrific clinician who will be with us, Heather Gregan, on that date. That is, These are all that I'm mentioning to you are available on Zoom, by the way. Um, the following week or two, uh, that will be on April 24th, we have a program for educators. Uh, so this is for uh, school administrators, superintendents, building principals, and so forth. Also, um, student assistance program folks, prevention specialists, anyone who's in that educational role in the K through 12 world. We welcome you to join us. We have a speaker from California. They've been at this for quite a while there in California, dealing with vaping and all that comes with it, meaning nicotine, THC, and so forth. Um, so that will be Emily Justice and also some of our local folks here know Dave Fialco. He's a uh, favorite presenter of ours who uh, I think might be on today's program. I haven't checked the the uh, participants yet, but he's um, he, we're really glad that Dave's going to be with us as well. He's so knowledgeable on these topics as well. Uh, another uh, good flyer with us is Ben Court, and he'll be with us via Zoom on April 30th to talk about lessons learned from Colorado, another state that has a great deal of experience with cannabis. So he'll be with us on April 30. Finally, um, we are very excited to have a new speaker with us on May 1st. That is Dr. Sharon Levy. She is uh, in at uh, Boston Children's Hospital. She's the chief of division of the Division of Addiction Medicine at Boston Children's. And she published um, a really terrific audible that's available completely free uh, on how to talk to your kids about substances. And she's really terrific and really are excited to have her with us again on Zoom on May 1st, talking about the new normal. That's how this is quite different from the cannabis of years past. And so she'll help us to unpack all of that. You can find these and many other programs on our calendar. I think we have some local in-person programs coming up that I hope you'll check out as well if you're from our neck of the woods here in the Philadelphia area. We also have about 140 or more programs recorded on our YouTube channel. So I invite you to check out those also. And I always like to take a moment to um, just let people know that we have some support group meetings for family members. Not only do we these do these community events, but we have programs or these meetings um, that take place every week 
Um, some of them are in person. This is our calendar of meetings. We have 21 meetings every week. About half are in person and the other half are on Zoom. So you can click on any of those buttons and get the details about the meeting, when it takes place, the Zoom link, if that's where it is, or the address if it's in person. And we're just parents like me. I have a son in long-term recovery and we need each other when we're in crisis, when we're not in crisis, we just need to be with others who understand some of what we've been through and to get support from one another. Along those lines, we also have a family recovery course. This is a, these are all completely free to attend, by the way. The family recovery course is a three-part course for, again, family members who've been impacted by their loved one's substance use. And the, the, you can go on that link and find upcoming programs, I'm sorry, upcoming um, courses that are available. There are usually three consecutive weeks on three consecutive Tuesdays, Wednesdays, whatever it happens to be. Um, but we cap that at 12 so that it doesn't get too overwhelming for our folks. But it's a really great course that is peer led and has had some really terrific outcomes. And I encourage you if it's relevant for you or for anyone that you're working with to uh, check that out. So I am so excited to introduce you to our speaker today. Um, Dr. Hawkins is the H. Guyford Stever University Professor of Operations Research and Public Policy at Carnegie Mellon University's Heinz College, and he's a member of the National Academy of Engineering. Dr. Hawkins specializes in systems anal analysis of the supply chains supporting illegal markets and criminal organizations, particularly problems pertaining to drugs, crime, terror, and prevention issues surrounding opioid markets and regulation, COVID-19 and cannabis leg leg legalization have been a focus in recent years, including co-authoring Marijuana Legislation, What Everyone Needs to Know, published by Oxford University Press. So I am so happy to introduce you to Dr. Jonathan Culkins. Oh, and I'm very happy to be here. Thanks for that introduction. And, and I think you nailed it. Um, so although I've written a couple of books on youth drug prevention uh, many moons ago, I am an atypical speaker in the sense that my background is in engineering and my stock and trade is walking in the shoes of the bad guys. So I understand the supply chains and logistics of criminal organizations and terrorists, whether they're in human trafficking, wildlife trafficking, or drug trafficking. And I got pulled into studying cannabis legalization way back in 2010 when California was considering doing that because I and my colleagues were able to anticipate the consequences of legalization for the industry, the products, uh, consumption and harms. And it led to the book that was mentioned. And I do a lot of work now on fentanyl, but I'm still uh, very interested in the topic of cannabis legalization and as a Pennsylvania resident course, very interested in the debate today. And like the number one bottom line thing to realize about legalization is it's not just same old, same old, but without the arrest. That's the big myth. The big misunderstanding is that all we're going to do is get rid of the law enforcement dimension. But everything about the structure, conduct and performance of the industry changes when you allow it to become legal. So, so that, in some sense, is the is the most important punchline. Let me uh, share screen so that you can see some slides because I can't uh, can't not bombard you with some uh, statistics and some uh, at, at some point. I'm not a medical doctor, so I don't want to spend a lot of time on the health harms. You have other speakers who will be able to do that better than I can, but I'll just make a couple of observations. One is that the health harms, or really I should say the harms of cannabis, are really different in character than for other substances. And this leads to a lot of misunderstanding about whether there are harms and the nature of those harms. So on this slide, I've listed four things that I suspect many of you have already engaged on and talked about. Uh, cannabis, like almost all psychoactive drugs, is a threat to brains that are still under development. Uh, it impairs driving, and we don't have good tests for impairment. It exacerbates the risk of psychosis, particularly for people with a genetic predisposition. And every time a jurisdiction legalizes, you get an increase in the number of very young kids who end up uh, finding 
it, like finding their parent supply, eating it, and uh, you need to go to the emergency room. That's all pretty straightforward and, and pretty well known. The things that I think don't get talked about as much as perhaps they should is a cannabis use disorder, i.e. substance use disorder, but specifically for cannabis. Um, that's a thing not only for kids. That affects adults, too. Cannabis is a dependence-inducing intoxicant. And there's a, a bit of an old belief that cannabis is primarily a young person's drug. That is not true anymore. In the 2022 household survey that asked about all sorts of drugs, including cannabis, for the first time, there was more use by people 35 years old and older than by people under 35. So if you just count up the total number of days of use reported and break it down by age, this is a middle-aged person's drug at this point. The median use is by somebody 35. 35 and older accounted for more than, than young people. And we sometimes allow ourselves to fall into the discussion that as long as we protect the kids, there will be no health harms. And that's just not right. The second bullet point up there just notes the sheer scale of intoxication that's involved with this substance. Um, it's on the order of 60 billion hours a year nationwide. So some people say, ah, I know it impairs me while I am high. I know it impairs my ability to learn. I know it impairs my short-term memory while I am high, but that's not a problem. That's not true anymore. Um, it used to be back in the early 1990s that cannabis was primarily used as a recreational drug, sort of a weekend drug. And if it wasn't being used during work time or school time, was there a problem? But now more than 80% of it is consumed by daily and near daily users. Uh, a stat that I uh, produced a few years ago was half of cannabis is consumed by people who spend more than half of their waking hours intoxicated. And just the acute effects of that intoxication matter because cannabis is not a performance enhancing drug. And I, I like to make this point by reference to my, my three kids who, who now delightfully have all graduated. So this is a, a story that was uh, originated a few years back when they were all in high school. Uh, my daughter was a pole vaulter. My one son was in debate club. My other son was in chess club. And I always like to point out that when my daughter went to a pole vaulting competition, it would have been rational for the opposing team's coach to worry if my daughter's coach had been slipping the kids anabolic steroids. Because anabolic steroids truly are a performance enhancing drug when it comes to physical things like pole vaulting. Contrast that with my one son going to a debate tournament. The opposing coaches did not have to worry that my son's coach was slipping the kids cannabis in order to improve their ability to speak coherently, to be articulate, and to complete sentences. And my son who was in the chess club, likewise, there was no reason for the opposing coach to worry that my son's coach was slipping the chess players a bunch of cannabis to improve their capacity to think ahead about the consequences of moves. Cannabis is just not a performance enhancing drug for thinking. And we are a society that no longer generates most of its activity by physical labor we're a society that depends on people being thoughtful and creative. And 60 billion hours a year of intoxication is not performance enhancing. And then the last point is the obvious one. Cannabis smoke has just as heavy a load of carcinogens and particulate matter as does tobacco smoke. Um, we, The average heavy user of cannabis is using more like one and a half or two grams of material whereas a pack-a-day smoker is consuming 20 grams of tobacco. So the total load of all those things that are not healthy for us might be smaller, but per puff, 
per gram, the cannabis is just as problematic and it is for kids and for adults. So there are a whole bunch of harms, but they're not the kind of harms that we're used to thinking about. Cannabis does not lead to violence the way that alcohol does with alcohol suppression of the prefrontal cortex. Cannabis does not lead to large numbers of people dropping dead from an overdose the way that happens with opioids. So because the harms are different than the harms we're used to looking for, there's an underappreciation of the harms. And as prevention folks are trying to engage constructively in cannabis, it's worth saying it's not a reasonable thing to say, is cannabis more dangerous than alcohol on the dimensions that alcohol is really dangerous on, engage on the dimensions of harm that cannabis produces. Um, another challenge for correctly communicating harms with cannabis, I'm attempting to capture on this slide, and that is just that it's complicated. And the fact that it's complicated makes it easier for somebody who doesn't want to believe there are harms to hide from that. So, for example, cannabis is consumed in many different ways, as I'm sure you are aware. Uh, back before legalization, almost all cannabis was consumed by smoking, and now it's consumed in every way you can think of. Solid edibles, liquid edibles, vapes, dabs. Tinctures are growing fast. There are even suppositories, lotions. I compare this to milk in the dairy industry. Cannabis 30 years ago was like milk. There might have been skim and whole, but it was all basically just milk. What we have now is the equivalent of the whole dairy industry with milk, ice cream, yogurt, cheese, cottage cheese, butter. And the particular risks for the different product forms do vary, and that complicates the messaging. For instance, you can absolutely say cannabis smoke has just as many carcinogens as tobacco smoke, and then somebody could say, ah, yeah, but I'm going to use in terms of edibles. And then you could say, well, that's good, but you have to recognize that when it's consumed in the edible form, there's a greater risk of taking a bigger dose than you meant to because the effects take a while to manifest. And so you have the scenario, famously Maureen Dow going to Colorado soon after it legalized. She got the candy bar, took a few bites, said, ah, this is nothing, took six more bites and half an hour later was very sorry. Um, and, 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 and so on for the other, other forms. And um, go to the third point, for instance, one of the fundamental facts about cannabinoids is they're fat soluble, not water soluble. And that really complicates the relationship between what you've just consumed and how it's affecting your body and how it's affecting your mind. Much more so than with alcohol. Alcohol is water soluble. It's a little tiny molecule. It slides easily back and forth across the blood brain barrier. So if you give somebody a breathalyzer, i.e. you measure the amount of alcohol in the breath that's coming out of their lungs, that gives you a really good idea of the amount of alcohol in their blood. That's why we call it a blood alcohol content measure. And if you know how much alcohol is in people's blood, you know how much is in their brain because there's no um, barrier to the alcohol passing across the blood brain barrier. And furthermore, the only molecule that is at all relevant for alcohol intoxication is the one molecule, ethanol. And when ethanol is broken down by the body, it's broken down into stuff that's totally inert. All that makes it really simple. And cannabis is really complicated. In the first place, what we talk about is the active ingredient, and it is an active ingredient, the, the THC is decomposed into other things, some of which are not active, but some of which are. So if you plot impairment or intoxication over time, what you would see for the stereotypical non-tolerant user is that the effects last for hours. 
But if you plot THC in blood, that's a very short spike and it drops right off. That doesn't mean the effects have gone away. It just means the THC has been metabolized into other active metabolites. And so now let's take this back to the impairment situation. In the first place, we don't have a breathalyzer test that tells you how much THC is in the blood. But even if you knew how much THC was in the blood, that doesn't tell you about the total amount of intoxicating load that's in the blood. But even if you knew the total amount of intoxicating load that's in the blood, it doesn't tell you what's going on in the brain because these are big molecules that don't move across the blood-brain barrier. And they're not excreted quickly the way alcohol is. They hang around in your fatty tissues and continue to leak back out into your bloodstream over time. Does all that sound confusing? That's my meta point. I don't need you to try to learn from me any of those details. You'd be better off learning those from a medical doctor. The point I'm trying to make is this is a much more complicated story. The harms are different and diffuse, and the mechanisms are also contingent on the mode of administration and a bunch of other details. And that really becomes a barrier when trying to communicate about the harms, because the story is just intrinsically more complicated. So anyway, I'm going to stop trying to pretend I'm a medical doctor there, and I want to switch over now and talk about the trends in the market and the supply and the products and the threats that they create that come along with legalization. And part of where this particular talk came from is I was engaged by some people who said, isn't high potency and high potency products the problem with legalization for health harms? And I wanted to try to give a different perspective. High potency products, they're definitely an issue. But I think that there are some even more fundamental things that are, are going on. And I want to make sure that everybody's on board with that. So where does the high potency come from in the first place? What, what's legalization got to do with potency? The short answer there is legalization allows production to shift from an artisanal craft, to be less formal about it, a bunch of 1960s hippies growing plants in their backyard, into an industrial operation, industrial agriculture with professionalism on all sorts of dimensions. So before legalization, a big grow was often 99 plants. And that was because there was a federal sentencing step up that hit you if you had 100 plants. So there might be 99 plants in a storage shed someplace grown by somebody who read a book somewhere, but that's all they really knew about growing marijuana. Now there are multiple facilities in the United States and Canada that are a million square feet or larger. These are large scale professional enterprises with people who are on site with things like PhDs in horticulture and bringing all the benefits of scientific agricultural to bear on producing. And so the plant is able to produce buds that have way more THC in them than in the past. Flower potency is very high, but it doesn't stop there because if you look at the cannabis plant, about half of these cannabinoids are in the flower, about half are scattered elsewhere in the plant. And elsewhere in the plant, they're not in high concentration. So if the only thing you can do is pick a piece of the plant and use that as your intoxicating product, you focus on those flowering buds. But there's about half the molecules somewhere else in the plant. And before legalization, that was basically just thrown out. It wasn't economically recoverable. But now there's nothing that prevents one of these industries from having an extraction machine that extracts those molecules and concentrates them so they can be used in dabs, they can be used in vaping oil, they can be extracted and infused in butter so that that can be used to make edibles. That extraction process is vaguely a little bit like how you take caffeine out of coffee beans to make decaffeinated coffee. It is much more complicated than any individual is going to do in their basement with they have 99 plants. 
it's not a particularly difficult thing for a legal company to do. So now all of a sudden, we've got an industry that says half the THC is in flour. We're happy to sell that. But half the THC is in this other form. And we want to mold the market and get people to start consuming this other product that we're automatically creating when we grow cannabis plants. And so let's let's look at some data for what happened. This happens to be Colorado. And this is the first basically two years after legalization. The height of the bars here are just indicating total sales of cannabis products. And it went up, no, no surprise. But the interesting thing is what share of those bars is colored green, meaning it's the old fashioned flower product. And originally, the market was primarily flour. And, and frankly, that, that graph starts in 2014. Colorado already had overt bricks and mortar cannabis stores for about five years before that as part of their medical system. So if I had the bars going back to before the medical legalization, you would have seen it as you know, closer to 100% flour. But over time, the market share shifted towards these other products because that is what the industry would like consumers to be buying. So they're able to sell the 50%, very round terms, 50%. It's not literally exactly 50%, but sell those other cannabinoids that are in other parts of the plant. And it's not only Colorado. This is essentially the same picture for Canada. On the left, it's mostly the traditional product. It's blue this time. It's probably poor choice of color on me. I should have made the blue green. But over the first few years after legalization, the industry changed the market in order to match what the industry wanted to sell. And so it's in some sense a fundamental characteristic of what goes on with the market dynamics. Um, I, I will say this now, just in case I don't get to it later. There's all sorts of energy in the United States and states like Pennsylvania to learn from other states. Excellent. But it's way better to learn from provinces. Uh, Canada did the legalization way better than any U.S. state has. Quebec in particular is the best of the best. If you're looking for models of the right way to do legalization, Quebec is better than any of the U.S. states. Anyhow, that's the sort of product form. Um, this graph is just about plain old flower potency, and it shows that over the long haul to give a sense of how much the product has changed with respect to potency over time. So. There's the dashed green line and the dashed red line pertain to two different types of cannabis. There's the Cincimia, which is essentially the only product on the market now. And then there's old fashioned commercial grade, what's really disappeared from the market, but was um, not just the flowering tops. Focus though on the blue line. The blue line is the average potency of cannabis seized in the country over time. And you can see that it grew over time enormously as the market shifted from that commercial grade to Cincimia. But then it jumped again when we got legalization. Those red dots are the first few years after legalization. Uh, these, these numbers happen to be Washington State, not Colorado. But the point is now flour is routinely over 20% potency up until the beginning of this century, you know, as late as 2000, the average potency didn't exceed 5%. And that's just flour. The, the number that's over 20% is not up high because we're rolling extracts and tabs in along with uh, uh, flour. This is just on the flour side. So 100% potency has gone way up. But I don't think that potency is the only story to pay attention to. And this is my quick David Letterman top 10, or at least top six I could fit on the slide list of reasons to be concerned about what happens in the market with legalization. And number one top of the list for me is just the straight up decline in the price 
per milligram of THC. So the, the, the price per gram drops and the milligrams of THC per gram goes up. So the price per unit of the chief intoxicant drops enormously. So here is, again, data from the very beginning of legalization with Washington State. Um, I shouldn't say very beginning. Uh, it's really common literally in the first six or nine months after legalization to see prices spike up. That's just the new industry working out the kinks in its supply chain. But by a year or so after legalization, you're seeing price declines. Um, the national wholesale prices dropped about 80%. The state of Washington, they were the particular audience for the uh, I created these slides for. Their prices at the wholesale level dropped about 80%. Their retail prices dropped about 75%. And at the same time, the potency was increasing the way that I, I just described. So the price per milligram of the principal intoxicant um, has dropped more like 90%. And it may not even have reached rock bottom yet. So historically under prohibition, a typical price for a gram of cannabis, i.e. like a large joint, is about $10. Production cost now is already getting down to about $100 per pound, 453 grams per pound. So this is like a factor of 45 reduction in price. And we may not even be at the bottom. Uh, with national legalization, I could imagine prices getting even lower. So here's some round numbers that are uh, instructive or shocking, depending how you look at it. In very round terms, competent cannabis farmers can produce about 1,000 pounds of dried cannabis material per acre. Um, Quick aside here. No, I'll, I'll come back to that in a minute. Let me finish this, this and then I'll do the aside. The production costs for regular crops that are about as complicated to grow as cannabis. So tomatoes are maybe a useful metaphor, maybe $10,000 an acre. Well, that, that $10,000 an acre, $1,000 a pound, we could be eventually after national legalization into production costs of $10 a pound, uh, $10 a pound at 453 grams per pound, you're down to pennies per gram, which is pennies per joint. So the fundamental impact of this from the industry's perspective is they're almost like the bottled water industry. They're going to try to get people to pay a lot of money for something that costs almost nothing to produce. And that drives a lot of behavior in the industry, a lot of behavior that is troubling. From the health perspective, the issue is a dependence-inducing intoxicant has become goofy cheap. It's already less expensive to entertain yourself by becoming intoxicated on cannabis than it is to entertain yourself by going to the movies. And that cost per hour is just going to continue to go down with legalization. And, and that, that's a threat on the public health side. Let me go back to the, the yield per acre point, because you may encounter people talking about this in, uh, in, in Harrisburg. So, so Governor Spiro, in his wisdom or lack thereof, has framed Pennsylvania's legalization in part as a farm and agriculture issue. And so there's a set of people out there who are thinking, uh, rah, rah, go legalization. This is important for Pennsylvania farmers. Um, nothing against Pennsylvania farmers, but that is just missing the point. Uh, this is first and foremost a health issue. And to make the point about why it's not a farm issue, go back to that thousand pounds per acre. The cannabis plant is actually a remarkably productive plant. It produces a lot of pounds per, per acre. And the weight that we consume 
is very, very small compared to the weight of other cannabis products. Somebody who's using one and a half grams a day, which is a fairly heavy user, is using a little over a pound a year. Um, imagine an Apple user. Imagine an Apple user who only used a pound of apples a year. That's like one big apple a year. With apples and potatoes and carrots, we consume much more weight per person. And the cannabis plant produces a lot of weight per acre. The total number of acres needed to produce all the THC for the whole country is on the order of like 10,000 acres. And you might think, oh, 10,000 acres, that sounds like a lot. It's not. Um, there are a lot of farms in Iowa that are 1,000 acres or more. So we're talking literally like 10 Midwest farmers who grow all the cannabis plants needed to supply the whole country with THC. And after national legalization, which I do think will happen eventually, there will be none of this separate Pennsylvania specific market. All of the cannabis is going to be grown in whatever small corner of the country is the lowest cost place to grow the cannabis, just like happens today with hops right? Beer, you can say, creates farming opportunities. And it does. There are people who grow hops and make money growing hops. But they're almost all concentrated in one corner of the country that is the most cost-effective way to grow hops. And they supply the whole country. There's no particular reason to think that Pennsylvania is going to outcompete Arkansas at growing cannabis, let alone outcompete Jamaica if international trade is, is allowed. And even if for some reason it ended up being Pennsylvania farmers that supplied the nation, it would only be 20 farmers or something like that. So the whole framing of the cannabis issue as a farming opportunity, and we're going to have the Department of Agriculture be the lead agency, is misunderstanding the basic physics of the, of the plant. Anyhow, enough enough about that. Let's get back to uh, this. This diagram just is meant to show again the the enormous declines in prices that you can expect with uh, legalization. But let me go to a different conceptual point because I do want to make sure I finish in time to allow a lot of Q and A. So there are a lot of these issues: normalization, regulatory capture. It's been remarkable how quickly the cannabis industry has become the dominant influence on the regulatory bodies in the different states. Um, but to, to the, the fifth point, um, and that is the another aspect of this. Legalization is not just same old, same old, but without the arrest. Because industry consciously chooses to reposition a the role that their product plays in society in order to expand their sales. Um, for instance, I uh, once had the chance to listen to a alcohol marketing consultant tell the story about how we got to um, a, a sort of hard liquor in cans. And essentially what happened is the hard liquor industry went to the marketing consultants and said, our sales aren't growing as fast as other aspects of the alcohol industry. What do you suggest we do? And the consultant looked around at a baseball game and said, nobody's drinking hard liquor at a baseball game back in the day. And it was because the hard liquor was only being sold in bottles. And so they went back and told the hard liquor industry, invent a new product that's sold in a can. And by the way, do things like flavor it. And then you can open up a new market space. Similar stories for marketing cigarettes to women in the 1920s, marketing wine to women in the 1980s. So once there's an industry out there, it's going to shift the way that cannabis is consumed. And so now I'm going to tell that story looking at growth in cannabis over time with four different measures of that growth. So the way to read this graph 
is it's normalized to 100 back in 1992. So we're just looking at growth relative to 1992. 1992 was the nadir of American cannabis consumption. It was high at the end of the 1970s because we had liberal policy. Then we had 12 years of Reagan Bush conservative policies and cannabis use uh, went way down. And then it started to come up after 92 and in particular grew a lot after 2008. So this line shows you the growth and the number of people who would self-report that they've used cannabis in the last year, and that has tripled. No surprise, there are more cannabis users. But that totally misses the real story. Because the big expansion is not increasing the number of people who use the same way it's always been used. The big change is the way in which people are using. All right, so here's a second line. This goes from people used in the last year to people used in the last month. And now it looks like a quintupling in use, it's starting to look like a bigger use. But the next line is going to be the number of days of use. So literally, you just ask in these national surveys, how many days did you use in the last month? And so now somebody who says, I used 25 days in the last month, counts 25 times as much as somebody who says, I only used one day in the last month. That is now the increase in the number of days of cannabis use over this 30-year period. It's a tenfold increase in the number of days of cannabis use. And what we really care about are people. And in particular, we care about people who use daily or near daily. The people who are only using once a week are experiencing a relatively moderate health risk. People who are using daily and near daily, they're the ones that are really exposing themselves to something of concern. So what do you think the line looks like for the growth since 1992 in the number of people who are using daily and near daily? There has been a 20-fold increase in daily and near daily use. Some of that is just more users, but a lot of it is this chart, right? So this chart is what proportion of current users are using daily or near daily, as opposed to, say, only using on weekends. The line on the bottom is alcohol, and the alcohol line really hasn't moved much. Alcohol has people who are daily and near daily users, including people who have lost control of that use, alcoholics. But most people who use alcohol are not using it daily or near daily. That used to be the pattern for cannabis. 30 years ago, cannabis was a recreational drug. It was something most people just used on weekends. It has become a lifestyle drug. It has become something that almost half of users use on a daily or near daily basis. It's just part of their daily life. In that sense, the pattern of cannabis use has become much more like the pattern of cigarette smoking. And this is what I think is, in some sense, the most startling of these ways of depicting the, the story. And that is, again, red line alcohol is just the total number of people using daily or near daily in the country. It has gone up a little bit over time. That's mostly just we have more people over time. Most of the growth in the red line is just growth in population. But the green line for cannabis has just exploded. 30 years ago, there were 10 times as many people using alcohol daily or near daily as marijuana. Now, after legalization, it is inverted. So it's not just did you use, it's how often you use. And then I want to get to how much you're using per day. And then I'll, I'll try to get to a wrap up and we'll do some questions. So now what I want to focus on is on a day that somebody uses cannabis, how many milligrams of THC do they consume? And what I'm going to do with this contrast is a double contrast. I want to be very upfront about this. I'm not only comparing 2022 to back in 1990s, same kind of person. I'm going to compare two different people and also at two different times. So the the first slide is going to be about the 
occasional or weekend only user back in the day when t when cannabis was less potent and the contrast is with the typical consumption pattern today of daily or near daily use All right so here's the math for back in the 20th century if somebody was using one joint per week and night so every friday and every saturday night but not during the work week joints back then were smaller they were about 0.4 grams and the average potency was around four percent so you just sort of do the arithmetic Two days out of seven, 0.4 grams, 4%. They were using about five milligrams of THC per day. And now let's contrast that with today's daily user who's consuming about 1.6 grams of material and that material is 20% potent. Now it's every day 1.6 times 20% or 320 milligrams, which is 70 times as much THC per day on average. So the problem is you've got all these people who say, hey, when I was young back in the 20th century, I used cannabis every single weekend night. Not a problem. Also not relevant. That's just not the same thing that's happening now. And most of the scientific studies, and there, there's a body of literature on the effects of cannabis, in the lab, they dose people with 20 or 30 milligrams. We're not, we don't even have studies that dose people with 300 milligrams. And so does this matter? Are there behavioral and health consequences of this huge increase in milligrams per day? Now, the optimistic story is the human body is amazing and we have a tremendous capacity to adjust and develop tolerance to things. When I grew up in upstate New York, I had no tolerance to hot temperatures. I then lived in the Middle East for a while where it was routinely 120 degrees, and I'm now much more tolerant of hot temperatures. So we have some ability to develop tolerance to things. So, you know, maybe this isn't really a problem, but maybe it is. So I want to do just a couple more comparisons. So you may or may not know this, but in the Andes in South America, the coca, the leaves of the coca bush, the same bush that you get cocaine out of, are used very much the way coffee, uh, coffee and, and tea are in the United States. It's a relatively mild stimulant. It helps people have energy and it, uh, it, it doesn't cause great problems. And notice that that 4.2 milligrams, very similar to the 20th century dose of the weekend warrior for cannabis. I was involved in a study of heavy cocaine use in the United States. It's from 20 years ago, but it still makes the point. If I divided the total milligrams of cocaine being consumed by the number of these, they use the term chronic. You can be a heavy, hardcore, frequent cocaine users whose lives were being messed up. I got a number remarkably similar so the difference in dose between the person in the United States whose life is dominated by cocaine and that person in the Andean culture using coca tea the way that we use regular tea and coffee, that's also about a 70-fold increase in dose. Is there a behavioral or health consequence of that 70-fold difference in dose? There sure is. And now let's, let's talk directly about caffeine. Um, I actually have a cup of coffee here, but frankly, I don't really like coffee that much. I would have Diet Coke, except I just don't have any near me. That's my drug of choice. My uh, norm Normally, I have one. I hold it up at this point and say, that's 76 milligrams of, of caffeine. What would it look like for me to increase my dose of caffeine by a factor of 70? That would be like my drinking 35 Grande Starbucks cappuccinos every single day. And would there be any behavioral or health consequence for me of that kind of increase in use? And it's not even really just a matter of these are pharma psychopharmacologically active molecules. So my daughter created this little video for me because I like blueberries. And so what's in the picture there is one sixth of a pint of blueberries. And now I'm going to contrast that with increasing my dose of blueberries by a factor of 70. And think about whether or not there are any behavioral or health consequences of a 70-fold increase 
in the number of blueberries that I consume. So I, I, I think you probably get the point. When the stuff becomes crazy cheap, the quantities consumed go way up. And this puts us into a domain we just have not been in before. And it is not just the kids. Frankly, these high frequency and heavy patterns of use are actually more common for adults. There are a fair number of kids who try cannabis, but they are not primarily the ones using daily or near daily or using huge quantities. So I'm totally excited about you guys protecting the kids. I think we sometimes um, are a little bit naive about thinking that there are no health consequences for the adults as well. Okay, I wanted to end by 2.30. I think I still can to leave time for questions. I want to circle back, though, to one particular point that you guys might encounter in addressing high-potency products. And... Uh, that is the question of whether or not it's possible to ban high potency products uh, without creating a large um, illegal market. So uh, by high potency products here, you, we could mean higher potency flour, but I'm mostly really thinking about just could you ban dabs and vapes? At one level, this is a very, very simple question because Quebec does it and it's successful. Quebec has never allowed the vapes and the dabs, and they have much lower rates of use, and they do not have very large black market consumption of vapes and dabs in Quebec. Um, yeah, uh, I was trying to give you the name of the author of the study, and I'm, I'm stuck on the wrong name. Ah, I, I will do it at the end of the talk. I've, I've got a mental block. David, my, it's my friend David, but I'm, I'm the, the wrong last name is popping into my mind. Um, so Quebec, again, is a good model, but I will uh, try to give you some other examples or other ways of thinking about, about this. Because a lot of people who are opposed to public health protection measures will say, if you restrict the market in any way, you're going to create a big black market, and that's bad, and that defeats the whole purpose of legalization. And that is misapplying the historical evidence. So it is true that if you ban an entire class of products that are appealing to people, some people will still want it. And then some other people are going to make money by providing it to them. So banning a whole class of products, like banning all cannabis, does lead to an illegal market. But it's very different if you only ban a subset of that spectrum of products and people can still have access to other things that are fairly similar. So um, in general, um, you're gonna have an, uh, uh, let me skip that. So if the United States banned all vaping products nationwide, then uh, there might be some degree of illegal supply. If Pennsylvania though alone banned the high potency products, what you would mostly see is illegal supply that looks a little bit like the illegal supply of alcohol to 19 year olds. It wouldn't be that it would be primarily illegally produced product supplying or supporting organized crime. It would be just stuff moving across state borders. And the Quebec example says, yes, that will happen some, but not as much. And if people push back on you, I want you to um, be armed with the ability to point out, we actually ban all sorts of things and we get away with it and there are not big problems. Um, so let me give you some of these examples. Just to shock people out of thinking only in terms of drugs, my favorite starter example is walk behind rotary mowers without a dead man switch. That's the fancy term now. We're just talking long mowers. Ever since 1982, the United States has had a prohibition 
on the sale of lawnmowers that do not have those bars that you must grip in order for the blade to spin. I have not had a lot of drive-by shootings in my neighborhood by gangs of people selling walk-behind rotary lawnmowers lacking a dead man switch. There's no big illegal market there. We are not stuffing our prisons with illegal producers of rotary mowers that don't have dead man switches. And why is that? Because we do allow the sale of walk-behind rotary motors that do have a dead man switch. They're a little bit more expensive, but nobody supports an illegal market. Another little example um, I like is Kinder Surprise Candies. So the US FDA has a ban, has a prohibition on any food appealing to a kid that contains a non-nutritive object. Only bureaucrats in Washington, D.C. could come up with language like non-nutritive object. In Germany, a Kinder Surprise egg is a chocolate egg and inside the egg is a toy. That is prohibited. That is banned in the United States. The Kinder Company does actually sell Kinder eggs in the United States now, but the toy is not inside the chocolate egg. It's just inside the packaging. And that's how they avoid the prohibition. Again, no drive-by shootings associated with illegal marketing of German-style Kinder eggs. But there is a little bit of an illegal market. My next door neighbor was a pilot for US Airways back in the day before it merged into American Airlines. He'd bring back these Kinder eggs for my kids at times. He was an illegal international smuggler violating that prohibition. But the prohibition works without creating a problematic black market. I published a paper uh, just this last year that looked at fireworks. And it turns out there's lots of very cool parallels between the prohibition and subsequent legalization of consumer fireworks. Happened around the same time as the original prohibition of cannabis. It's been repealed for some of the same sort of issues. And uh, yeah, the story is a very interesting parallel. Um, we banned consumer fireworks because of concern of harms to users, mostly eye injuries and also to kids. And that ban was in place. It started with state and local bans. Um, then it was federalized for uh, many decades. And as part of this general cultural trend that we're in now, where we're legalizing gambling, legalizing cannabis, we legalized fireworks. But there was never any big illegal market in fireworks. And there are examples of bans in the substance space that have not created huge problematic black markets. Um, for reasons that were probably not very logical, absinthe was a particular kind of liquor that was prohibited in the United States for almost a century without creating big black markets. Cuban cigars have been banned, caffeinated alcohol drinks, flavored cigarettes. It's just not true that a state, or for that matter, the federal government, can't ban a product without creating an intolerable black market. We do it all the time. Is it actually a good idea to ban these high potency cannabis products? I think that's a somewhat difficult question and you have to think through all the pros and cons of it, but it's just not right that it's something that we can't contemplate or that would automatically go badly. So if you believe that Pennsylvania's cannabis legalization would be better if it were restricted just to basic flower products, the way Canada did nationwide for the first year, the way Quebec still does, that's an option that really can be discussed. Don't let anybody tell you that's a non-starter because it'll create a, a bunch of problems with, with the illegal markets. All right, it is 2.29. So for the first time in history, a professor has finished talking a minute before planned. And I would love it if you guys had some questions. I hope what I said was provocative and, uh, and that we can have a good discussion. That was fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, 
Bob and I are texting each other like great information, really helpful to hear some different perspectives. So thank you very much for that. Love to hear from all of you. Questions that you have, comments. I saw an email ahead of time that somebody had asked about um, the opt-out legislation. Uh, the particular framing of the question was, how do you get opt-out or how do you prevent vape shops? Uh, that's like a question of how do you make things happen in Harrisburg? And I know I don't know the answer to that. But what I will just affirm is that um, it makes a lot of sense for a state that's legalizing cannabis to allow local opt-out, meaning the local rules to be stricter um, than what, what what's allowed elsewhere in the state. Even Colorado, the you know the very first state to open adult use stores, I think the correct way to say it is the majority of jurisdictions in Colorado opt out and have no bricks and mortar retail stores. They are not the majority of the population. The cities where most of the people are opted in, but Colorado's rules allowed opt out. And I think the majority of the jurisdictions chose to opt out. I think it makes total sense because there's diversity uh, across a, a big state. Different communities are going to want different things. And frankly, even if I were whispering in the ears of the pro camp, I would suggest they allow opt out because you will get more resistance to a statewide liberalization if everybody is going to have to have it in their face. So I think uh, other states have done opt out. I think it's a good policy. I don't know how to make anybody in Harrisburg listen, but I would point out that there's a good logic for it and other states have done it. And it's not really been a problem from the perspective of industry or legalizers. An important thing to remember is cannabis is light and not perishable. You don't need to have a cannabis store walking distance from where you are so you can buy it every single day. It's not perishable. It's not a real burden on a cannabis consumer if they have to drive 20 miles to get to the cannabis. Really, uh, really great point there. I just wanted to add um, that back in November of 2023, we narrowly dodged um, a bill. Uh, it was a Senate Bill 773, um, which was originally a 14 page um, bill that uh, increases uh, permits of uh, marijuana growers and direct from grower to retailer sales. And it was rewritten last minute into 140 page full rec adult use legalization bill. And what we're seeing with a lot of the legislation that's being written right now is a elimination of any opportunity for communities to opt out. And that was particularly one of the main lines that was uh, of major concern, especially uh, with law enforcement associations and things like that, where communities could not opt out of hosting um, you know, for-profit, um, you know, commercial, retail, adult-use cannabis. So you raise such an important point, um, but it's not a given. We have to, you know, as a, as a uh, uh, as preventionists, we've got to be aware of the legislation that's on the table and 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 all the liners. Yeah, I just wanted to put that out there. But thanks so much for bringing that up and and, and outstanding stuff. Great, great, great stuff. Um, love the agricultural impact. Um, you know, everything from the 20 billion hours of impairment down to, uh, you know, edible uh, differences. Really, really great stuff. Thanks. So I just got a question from someone. Is there an, um, any age uh, information da data collected on the age of everyday users? I'm not sure if you're referring to Pennsylvania in particular and nationally to the participant. So yes and no. Um, almost all states forbid the collection of data on the customers at the stores. The reason for that is a concern that as long as it's still federally illegal, uh, if you collect that private information about people, it could harm them. But we do have these huge surveys. Um, the most famous, best known National Survey on Drug Use and Health asks 60,000 or so people every year all sorts of questions about their substance use. And in those surveys, you, you get the age. So um, 
I made brief reference to this point. I'll, I'll, I'll uh, elaborate on this a little bit. Um, basically, half, it's actually slightly more than half of the cannabis days of use are reported by people who are 35 and older, half under 35. And um, I skipped this slide, but uh, I can do a pie chart that sort of breaks out the cannabis market. And um, I've done that in, in two ways, uh, in part by age, are they young or old? Well, I really three ways, are, are they young or old? Are they high frequency users or low frequency? And do they have some substance use disorder? Any substance can be alcoholism, cocaine. And that, then you kind of see who the, who's the market. And by the, the biggest wedge is um, is people with a substance use disorder. So almost half of cannabis is consumed by people who have some evidence of a substance use disorder. Maybe not current, but like they say, I've been in treatment in the past. The next biggest wedge by far, almost 40%, is adults who use daily and near daily, and they don't report problems with their use. Now, they might actually have problems, but just be in denial. But they say, no, it's not It's not messing up my life. The really good news is that the under 21 group who, who don't have substance use disorders, um, they're only 7% of the market. And this reflects, I think, two things. The first is a lot of kids just don't have the opportunity to consume three times a day. Uh, they might be able to sneak away from their parents and use, but they can't do that three times a day, every single day. Um, and the other thing is, to a degree, cannabis is losing its cool. And in the long run, this is good news for prevention folks. It's gone from being the young college rebels drug to it's like Willie Nelson. If you look at a picture of Willie Nelson, Willie Nelson does not look like what every young person aspires to look like. Um, so uh, I, I think I used to really worry about normalization. And I am still worried about normalization. I think one of the problems of bricks and mortar stores and advertising and everything else is it it makes it not seem dangerous. But it does also make it seem sort of boring. And like if I'm trying to design the prevention curriculum going forward, I I might lean in a little bit to this is the boring drug that makes you stupid. Uh, instead of this is a really dangerous thing, just make it like that's your parents' drug. Really? <laughs> Aren't you, are, are you really wanting to be like your parents? Um, so anyhow, I, I'm, I'm not the prevention expert. I'm not going to tell you guys how to design it. But um, it is really striking to me that it, for, for decades, we thought drugs were what young people did until they grew up. And legal cannabis is not that. Legal cannabis is a middle-aged drug. The truth campaign with tobacco got a lot of traction when it shifted from cigarettes will kill you in 35 years to the evil industry is trying to manipulate you by altering the amount of nicotine in the cigarette. And young people did not like the idea of big tobacco manipulating them. Big cannabis 100% does the same thing. So dispelling the leftover images of the cannabis industry as these sort of backyard amateurs, um, it's like those folks still exist, but they are not the dominant part of the industry and they are kind of roadkill. But like another thing that you'll encounter in, in Harrisburg is there's all this idea of we want to create a lot of opportunities for small businesses, for people to make money. And especially there's a social justice dimension, like 
folks who were disadvantaged by the war on drugs, let's give them the chance to take their life savings invested in a brand new startup industry, startup company in an industry that is already consolidating and has lots of people going out of business. Why is that a favor to, it's the, the winners in the cannabis space are the organizations that can achieve economies of scale. They achieve economies of scale in production, and increasingly, they have economies of scale in brand management and marketing. And if you're just some little producer, uh, yeah, I, I don't want to buy stock in you. You're 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 potentially going to be roadkill. Um, it is the more, it's the larger entities that are uh, are, are going to win, and it's larger entities that are already to some extent winning. And so, you know, telling kids. This is sort of the big marijuana, the big cannabis story, and some of the bad stuff they do. They they bribe people in government. Um, the testing is totally corrupt in a lot of places. So you, you probably know this, but the base backstory is um, when somebody produces cannabis, it gets sent to a independent lab to be tested. And then the result of that test goes on the label. The theory is, hey, we're going to have labeled cannabis. We'll know what's in it. But it doesn't work for uh, two reasons. One is this temporary reason that it is difficult for the states to regulate those labs while there's still federal legalization. So after federal legalization, it will be easier for a state to regulate the labs. But right now, the labs are paid by the producers. And so the labs say whatever the producers want. Producer sends them 100 pounds. They put the first test through the machine and it gets rejected from too much mold. They say, ah, oh, bad test. Let me try another sample. Let me try another sample. I'll just keep retesting until I find a piece of it that doesn't have mold and doesn't have pesticides. There are even dry labs is the euphemism for it. In a dry lab, they don't even own a machine. They just print the label. And the, the lab basically says to the producer, what would you like your label to say? We'll put that on and you'll pay us for this counterfeit label. Um, yeah, so th there's a lot of unseemly sides of this industry. Um, then anyhow, if, if you can sort of tap into anger at the industry, that'd be another angle. Yep, great, great point. Uh, someone had asked if you'd be willing to share a copy of your slides. Yes. If that's a yes, great, then we will be happy to put that on that follow-up page, the cannabis page the Pop shared in the link earlier. Um, another question came in, um, can you talk about the rate of consumption of medical cannabis um, as compared to, well, in Pennsylvanians, but in particular, like have the rates, you talked a lot about the national usage, that sort of thing that have changed, but what about um, medical cannabis here in PA? Yeah. Um, I don't know the the... PA specific uh, data, but you can get it. So I refer to this National Survey on Drug Use and Health in 2002, maybe? Uh, a number of years ago, they expanded the sample so big that you can get state specific estimates in uh, pairs of years. So in order to make the Pennsylvania sample big enough to give a Pennsylvania specific number, they pool two adjacent years. So it'd be not like the 2022 survey but it'd be 2021, 22 combined. That um, data are available from SAMDA, Substance Abuse Mental Health Data Archive. And it's a pretty user-friendly interface. So you, you could do your runs. And there's a, a variable that basically says, is, I think the, I'm not sure, the phrasing might be, is any of the cannabis you consume medical cannabis? Uh, and then you can just sort of cross-tab how many people are using their ages and so on with the answer to that. I, I don't know the Pennsylvania numbers off the top of my head. The broad pattern is when there's not adult use cannabis available, there's a lot of use of medical cannabis. After there's adult use available, it kind of depends how the state handles it. Um, some states have moved most of their medical quote unquote, medical consumers over into the non-medical market like Washington state has. 
um, some states, because there continues to be a noticeable difference in taxes, people continue to obtain a medical recommendation, which is essentially access to tax-free cannabis. But the, the majority of the cannabis sold under medical cannabis is really not a different product than the cannabis sold under adult use. There is such a thing as honest to goodness medical cannabis that's FDA approved. That's like for treating childhood epilepsy. It's a teeny, teeny, tiny uh, niche market. And then there's a, a bigger but still small market for primarily CBD, but not the FDA approved version. This is plant material just grown in a way that has a lot of CBD, not much THC. That I think could, you know, like legitimately be called, it's a different product than the average adult use product. Um, but that is still a small portion of what is sold as medical cannabis. Most of what's sold as medical cannabis is essentially the same product as the adult use product. I just pulled up um, and I'm putting the, the link in the chat for anybody who wants to see it. I'll quickly share my screen and just show you all what I found here. Um, this is from the Pennsylvania Medical Marijuana Advisory Board. Um, this is just showing the metrics. It's not showing growth in use, but I, I have another document that I can't put my hands on right now, but I'll share that as well. Um, so you can see actually here's here are dispensary sales looking at 2020 through 2020. Three, really, we only see the first two months of 2024, of course. So that gives you a pretty good idea. Yep. There's a the lot of it. Sales. That's 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 a dollar amount. But then you have to look at this to see, to your point. <laughs> oh, that's a nice graph. Yeah. Can you send me your slides? Well, this is what I just put in the chat. This is just a, on their website. Thank on you. State's website. I had not seen that. That's a cool slide. Yeah. 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 So this is looking at sales, but again, it's not showing volume. It's showing dollar amount. Right. And if the dollar amount's coming down, that tells us that the sales are actually exponentially higher, I would assume, right? Yep. <laughs> so yeah. Yep. Uh, no, there's a, there's a lot of a lot of medical. And sort of the, the, the Ganonkin experiment or hypothetical is, suppose that adult use had been legalized first and then medical came along, I think there'd be really not very many medical users. So the majority of medical use is just a way for people to obtain access to it. Another way to think about it is there's sort of not just medical, non-medical. It's almost like there's three things. There's medical in the Western scientific sense of medical of an FDA approved product. Right now, there's very little of that. There might be some more of that going forward, but it's not that that's that's this thing. And then there's use by people who say, I'm using this because I think it's fun. But in between is a really big part of the market that's almost more like the nutraceuticals and things you get at GNC, where people believe they're deriving some health benefit because it's natural and it's part of their daily activity. It's not FDA approved medical, but they wouldn't say I'm using it because it's fun. They're using it because it is part of what they think is their lifestyle. And um, yeah, it's almost like ginkgo extract kind of thing. And, and that's not a small segment of the market. It's a strange segment, not a small segment. Right. Uh, yeah. See another question, but here's a, another little bit of information that I'll share that I found recently when I was looking for some, some info on this. Um, so I downloaded this PDF, but I can't find the original source, but it was on the, the state's page, but this is looking at year one. And if you see that there were now up to 24 conditions, right? Medical marijuana that, that you can get you a medical marijuana card. Um, so if you just take a look at some of these numbers, this is 2017. Sorry, hang on a second. Okay, so 2018, 2019. I want to jump ahead here uh, to 2023. Number one, anxiety disorders. Look at that. And yep. That wasn't even part of the one of the options the first several years. Um, number two is uh, intractable pain, I believe. Yeah, right here. 
And yeah. number three, I believe, is PTSD. Whatever that is. But quite, yeah, it's but quite a bit. Quite further a bit down. Yes. Right. Right. Yeah, quite so a bit the, further, right. Yeah. So the number one and number two, anxiety and, and general pain, those are two things for which the clinician has no ability to just objectively test. So they're the perfect diagnosis to use if you want a recommendation. They're also very common situations. And one of the things to realize is that for most of these conditions, the cannabis is just alleviating a symptom. It's not treating the disease. Right? So like, like with glaucoma, there was actually a logical argument that cannabis would reduce interocular pressure. It, it was directly addressing the underlying condition. We don't do this anymore because we got better things than cannabis for it. But but for for other things, it's like it's not really any different than somebody comes home from a stressful job and has a glass of wine to help calm them down. Or the blue collar worker who comes home from a hard day of physical labor with aches and pains and drinks a beer. It, 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 yeah, it does alleviate the symptom. But it is it's a it's an odd concept in some ways to think about that as medical. It's it's true that it has effects, but you're not treating the underlying condition. Oh, opioids don't heal a broken bone. They make you care less about the pain that you have from the broken bone. So very yep. small. Uh, yes, Gail, go right ahead and unmute and ask your question, please. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Calkins. I, uh, it was very interesting. <clears throat> I, the question I have for you is I, um, it, I, it's really disappointing to me how bad the uh, the laboratory testing and labeling has been. As um, as I used to work with a lot of pharmacists, I'm a, a doctoral student, and I um, went to I uh, worked at University of the Sciences when they first started doing a lot of the continuing education courses. So I saw a lot of pharmacists really taking education courses and being really concerned about the bad labeling of cannabis and that you didn't know what was in it, and they were really hopeful that that could change eventually. And, um, and when I hear from you about the labs being corrupt, which I had already heard, I mean, it's obviously there's a conflict of interest. I'm wondering, um, can that change? And I get that, yes, the federal thing causes some difficulty in, um, in regulating that. But I really feel like the state just hasn't done a good job. Like they haven't tried very hard to regulate the labs and, and inspect them. And that's my personal feeling. And uh, so I'm wondering, what are they doing differently in Quebec? You said that their policy is better there. Like, what are they doing in Canada to make sure that lab testing and and ultimately labeling requirements um, are, are better or, or are they better there? So, yeah, it, it, there's a I'm not sure I know exactly how Quebec enforces their, their labeling, but the basic idea is in Quebec, or anywhere else in Canada, because the material is fully legal, a state employee can just go to the retail store, buy the bag, put it in their own government lab machine, see what they get. Okay. And if the test label is incorrect, somebody can lose their license or worse. And in the United States, the basic posture, at least in many states, is we cannot force our government employees to do something that is against federal law. And so we don't just do the auditing. Um, I'm not enough of a lawyer to know whether at this point, Pennsylvania could just go audit by getting something at the store and run it through your own machines. But that's what you want to do. You want to audit the, the labels and you want to yank the lab license from a lab that is giving inaccurate labels. And if you take their license away, they cannot operate as a business, they're gone. The problem right now is that the cheater labs uh, offer lower cost than the honest labs because the honest labs actually have expenses. If you have a dry lab, meaning you're just printing the label, you can outcompete the honest lab. Right. If the illegal lab gets shut down, then there's room for the honest labs to do what they're supposed to do. 
Thanks. That makes sense. Yeah, no, they're you're right. The government employees are not testing. I think that they've 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 had one or at least one case. I've been following it really closely where they did report on some um, improper lab testing. And I think it was from a whistleblower, like somebody in the lab complaint. I see. Right. That's the you know, that's something that they can act on because they can, you know, get that information from an employee. Yeah. No, like if if any of you could just use your clout in Washington, D.C. to have a simple law come out of the federal government, which is um, we will allow the possession of cannabis by an enforcement agency for the purposes of enforcing labeling honesty. That, I think, would be a very sensible thing that whether you're for or against legalization in general, you probably favor that so you can get the la the labels to be better. Do you have any thoughts? Uh, just my last question. Do you have any thoughts on uh, on what's happening federally? Um, you know, the Biden administration has been talking about um, asking the asking for a reclassification. I do, um, but one of my thoughts is uh, it's very hard to predict the future, so I, I don't tend to know what's going to happen. I have a smart friend who lived in D.C. and was part of that process who is pretty cynical and thinks that the reclassification request is a, an attempt to win some votes knowing that ain't nothing going to happen before November. And one part of this is to realize none of the existing state legal cannabis industry can legally operate after cannabis moves to Schedule 3. Every single Schedule 3 drug can only dispensed, be dispensed by a DEA-licensed pharmacy in response to a prescription written by a DEA-licensed physician. Exactly none of the legal cannabis industries, either medical or non-medical, are complying with that. None of them are complying with uh, GMP, I think is the acronym, Good Manufacturing Practice. It basically just says if you want to sell any medicine, you have to guarantee that from dose to dose it has the exact. So the whole industry would go from being illegal under the Controlled Substances Act to illegal under Fed FDA rules. And I don't know if the cannabis industry even wants that. So um, I, if it actually moved to Schedule 3, then the FDA has to decide whether it's going to enforce its rules or not. And the cannabis industry doesn't want them to. It's actually technically very difficult to take plant material and make it dose to dose as consistent as what you get out of a, a, a pill or whatever. So anyhow, I, 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 my, my friend maybe is a little too cynical, but his view is the Biden administration knew that was going nowhere before November and the cannabis industry doesn't even really want it to happen. Who knows? Really, John, thank you so much. Um, Bob, any last words, thoughts, anything? That was great. Thank you. My pleasure. Great questions. Yes. Have a good day.